My name is Philip Skandera, and today I would love to present to you my own homemade 32-bit RISC-V CPU that I've been building for the past two years. Basically, I will show you what is possible with RISC-V and a lot of dedication. But firstly, I would love to introduce myself a little bit more. I come from a city of Olomouc in Czech Republic or Czechia, and I'm 19 years old. And I've just graduated from a high school and secondary school of electrotechnical engineering in Olomouc. I plan to continue my studies at university later this year. And, you know, of course, I'm a huge fan of Risk V. Who wouldn't? <laughs> And before we get to my Frisk 5 CPU, I would love to show my first homemade CPU I've made about three years ago. It is made also only out of discrete components, and it is based on uh, it is based on a CISC architecture. I was pretty happy with it, but I felt kind of limited by the architecture itself. Well, don't get me wrong, it was great, but something wasn't quite right. It was just after I discovered Risk V. I've read everything I could about Risk V, and I found it more standardized, and it really made much more sense to me, really. But one of the biggest advantages is its open source license, which is not really seen in any other popular architecture. This is groundbreaking. And here is a little sneak peek of my device. On the left image, you can see it without the case, and on the right image, you can see it with the case on. I will make a live demo right here in just a second. First, let's talk about some specifications. Of course, it is based on the RV32i standard, which is really the bare minimum for any RISC V CPU. It is made only out of discrete logic components and memory fees, logic components like 748CT245 and mainly EEPROMs as memories, but some drives as well, of course. Clock frequency of my device is 500 kilohertz, which is fine for this prototype and it really serves well for the demonstration purposes I will be showing later. It also has a RAM, some IO board, and instruction memory inside. Yeah, uh, so basically it is a very, very simple computer. On this image, you can see a 3D model of the whole CPU. The main core, which is located inside the case, is made out of nine PCBs that are stacked in a double-like structure and connected only by a pin headers. This CPU also integrates a VGA card, which is the one on the top, and it has a resolution of 200 by 100 pixels, and it is black and white. <laughs> it also has four I/O ports and a USB-C connector for 5 volt power. The case was entirely 3D printed. And every layer of this CPU has its main purpose, as you can see on this image. But as I will show in a minute, some layers can serve multiple purposes. I've made every PCB fit into a 10 by 10 centimeters area to lower the production costs even more. This has a pretty significant benefit. Well, everything is modular, so I can fairly easily swap any PCB for a potential upgrade. But on the other side, uh, this made debugging much more harder. Hence, you will see how I've tackled this problem. So here you can see a block diagram of my CPU. Each arrow represents a 32-bit bus lane. I took a lot of inspiration from a book by David Peterson and John Hennessy called Computer Organization and Design Risk Five Edition, which by the way is a great book. I highly encourage you to read it. But in some cases, I've managed to fit more than one block onto one PCB. For example, the immediate generator, which is uh, located on the left image 
bytes below the instruction memory shares the same PCB as the instruction memory. So this way we can have some space on the PCB. I've simulated my CPU in a program called Logisim Evolution. Here I've tested its main features and the overall design. I know this isn't the best program for simulating a complex CPU, especially for hardware design, but it really helped me quite a lot. And it's free, which is really awesome. And I think it is really an underrated tool for beginners, hobbies, everyone basically. I think it's a very great tool for electronics in general. And here is one of the nine PCBs, which I've designed in a program called Autodesk Eagle. This is uh, the VGA card to be more precise. I then send it to a Chinese company called JLC PCB for manufacturing. And after receiving the ports, it was time to solder every IC by hand, which was quite a tedious process based on how many of ICs there are. This is the prototype of Pineapple One that I call Pineapple Zero. Well, nothing ever works on the try, on the first try, never. So I decided to make a prototype version first, which in hindsight, which is hindsight was a really good idea. I've tried to separate everything into its own sections to make it as modular as possible. And I've also added test points all around my PCBs to make the debugging process at least a little bit easier. And it really helped me. And of course, debugging, especially in such a large project, you might think that some high-tech lab is needed, but this is not really the case, like not at all. At that time, I didn't even have a proper oscilloscope. So my only option was to get creative. I've designed a 32-bit bus reader that could be attached to uh, the side of my CPU. You can see it on the right image here. These readers would collect as much information from the CPU as possible and will automatically send it to my Python program, which will compare it to, to my simulation and then find some inconsistencies. And if some inconsistencies are found, it will immediately call the CPU and inform me with all the necessary information for me to take the, the manual control and investigate a little more. I spent at least three months purely just debugging this. It was a really exhausting process, to be honest. And after all this finally works, Everything is done and it is time to assemble the final product. Here are all the pieces I used in my CPU. Something about programming. Programming my CPU is very easy. Firstly, your C file or C code will be converted into a binary file by the compiler. Then my Python program will take this binary data and automatically connect to the program via a USB cable, if it established the connection, if it was found, of course. When it established a connection, it will send the binary data to the programmer, which is connected to the CPU via a RS232 cable, by the cable, not the protocol to be more exact. Hence, once the connection is established for the first time, you can simply start uploading new file anytime you want without any reconnecting or resetting anything. Everything is happening automatically, which is a real time saver. And now I will make a live demo. So let me just pause this presentation and don't worry, I will come back to it in just a second. But uh, as for now, you can uh, minimize it and zoom to my uh, webcam, everything will happen here right now. So I will switch 
to my second camera and I hope you can see something there because the sun just set can turn into light. Maybe you this will help or more. Okay. I'm sorry for the sun it just set and the lighting is not great, but you can deal with that. I hope. Light here. Okay. I think it is slightly better now. So <laughs> Here is the CPU itself. We don't see much from the outside except from the front panel. Here we can find things like the USB-C connector for, for power, reset button on and off switch, programming connector, VGA output, and two input and two output ports. They are 8 bit each, and this is port A, port A, B, C, and D. Now we can separate the case and the case is held to the main or to the actual CPU by these three screws, which I've removed beforehand to make life a little bit easier. <laughs> so now I can just slide up and voila, here we got the main core. The main core is uh, the main core consists of nine PCBs. They are two layer each and on this call, there is more than 230 integrated circuits, which I think is quite amazing on how dense or how small this whole CPU is. Each layer is connected via the spin header, so there aren't any floppy cables basically anywhere. Uh, we can see cables on the top and they are connecting the outputs and VGA outputs to the panel here. Okay, so I think now it is time to plug it in. I will remove this one and I can connect a USB-C connector for the power. I'll bring it closer and now we can turn it on. And the CPU runs, which is amazing. But what we can do with it? Well, we can connect, for example, a keyboard. For this, I prepared a PS2 adapter, which will connect to one of these input ports. And I will do it right, like so. Okay, nice click. And I can connect my PS2 keyboard to the adapter itself. Okay, so now we can write some commands and the CPU will execute them, but we don't see much currently. So I will connect my external monitor to my CPU. And we should hopefully be getting awesome the fine shell. I hope this is visible. It should be. And this is a very rudimentary shell like program that I've written. And basically it's a simple terminal. It just accepts commands and will spit out results. So I can test it by saying hi and pressing enter. And the CPU will answer by saying hello, of course. Awesome, I can type hello and the CPU will say hi, pretty neat. I can, uh, for example, type system information, system information for seeing some more system information. This is awesome. I can get back to the screen by pressing escape. I uh, can show it to you by pressing escape, like so. And we are back to our basic terminal. So uh, I would just test that some uh, totally random strings are not recognized and it will result in an unknown command. This is just to show that the CPU uh, does understand and will compare these instructions and will not just do things randomly. I can clear the screen using the clear commands and by pressing enter, the screen will clear. Awesome. And for those of you who remember the old peak and poke commands, well, my CPU supports it as well, which is awesome. And I will demonstrate it here. So I will type peak and some random address. And for example, if I press enter, 
we will get some value from that address in RAM. Uh, I can like both and let's say the same address. And just to say, this is not really recommended changing any values in RAM, basically any random address in RAM when the CPU runs, it will most immediately result in the CPU holds. And I know this well from the address I've written in. So if I press enter, yes, the CPU reset it, which was the <laughs> better than the case, but uh, I'll reset it just to be sure <laughs> once again, because once again, changing any values in RAM is not recommended like at all. <laughs> so if you get, uh, and of course we can uh, issue these weekend poke commands to any part of the memory, to the RAM, to the video RAM, we can write some characters like, for example, some uh, custom, not really a font, but custom emoji, text, letter, everything we basically want. And of course, we can write also to the uh, output port and read by the P command from the input port. Uh, I have here a this little LED board, which is used to demonstrate uh, some outputs. And I think I have time for that. So I will do that and plug it to one of the output ports. And I have some buttons on this other board to test some inputs. So I will do that. I will plug it into the, another input port. So, and here is a little animation playing that I've programmed. And if I press different buttons, it will change the animation. It's pretty simple, but it uh, just shows the capabilities and the input output capabilities capabilities of the CPU to be more exact. So this is, this can be seen. Okay, awesome. So I'll unplug it to have just more space to work with. So let it be with me just a second. Okay. And so uh, there is a small hidden feature that I almost forgot about. I hope it will be seen. There is a small seven segment display on the top of my CPU core. And so uh, this was meant to show some opcodes. I don't know, this is fully programmable by the programmer. Oh, we can of course change it by the bulk command. This was meant as a postcode uh, information to the user or the programmer when something went wrong. We can use it basically for whatever we want. <laughs> and if we get bored of all our beats and poking, we can run a snake program. This is a very, very simple snake program. And I'm controlling it by the arrows on my keyboard. And if I grab the little question mark, I will get longer. <laughs> this is neat. Yeah, this is pretty addictive. <laughs> I can get back to the terminal uh, again by pressing the escape command, like so. Okay, so this is all from this demo and I will continue with my presentation. Uh, let's see a second. Position things here. Okay, it seems it is now working and I Okay, uh, I think it should be yes, yeah, it looks it looks like it's working. So I can launch my presentation again. Okay, yeah, uh, there it is. So that's all from the demo. And this is cool, but what's next? What we can really do with it? So since I finished that build or this prototype, I've been prototyping an improved version of my CPU that could crunch every instruction in just two cycles. 
combined with some additional features like, for example, better VGA outputs, more colors, obviously, uh, or an audio card, this could become much more interesting. I would also love to turn this into a DIY kit of some sort, where you could build your own 32-bit RISC-R CPU. And this is not really a common thing to say. Wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> I hope so. But of course, this is too much for one person to handle. This is why I created a Discord server where I'm sharing latest updates and discussing some features with the community, which, by the way, was incredibly amazing by helping with so many different things. If you want to participate, which I would be really glad if you do, you can join by the link visible on screen right now. I will also post it in chat, or you can find the link on my Twitter profile. And I almost forgot to mention it, but the whole CPU is fully open source. And you can find all the schematic, pardon, all the schematics on my GitHub profile. This is awesome. <laughs> and I'm also starting a, a docu documentation process on my YouTube channel. So feel free to visit it as well. <laughs> I hope you will like it. And that is all from me for today. Thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I'm more than happy to answer them all. Uh, Philip, thank you very much. Uh, that's quite a remarkable project. Um, thank you. And um, um, takes me back to my youth. And an uh, interesting performance. I think, as I, I saw on the Discord, as someone noticing, it's it's exactly the same clock rate, I think, as the 6502 processor that went into a BBC Micro. Um, and it is also the same clock rate as EDSAC, one of the first uh, computers, which was actually designed by our founder, Morris Wilkes. So um, uh, it's obviously a, a clock rate chosen for remarkable computers. Um, Philip, if you're happy to, um, I'll open the floor to any questions. If you'd like to ask a question, either open up your camera and microphone and start it, or type it into the uh, 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 channel there. Um, um, so, uh, Philip, this is an excellent exercise in traditional um, logic, and you've talked about, you know, making us, you know making a new version that has a has more features but if that's sort of an incremental project do you have any other projects that you are thinking of of going radical on or anything <laughs> like outside of my uh, cpu hobby and cpu making hobby or well i just wondered i mean the, the next the next project is clearly an incremental step on this i wondered if you had any completely different projects because um this sort of um completely sideways thinking about how to approach a project Will be interesting. I personally would be very interested to see your current project benchmark with mbench, um, just to see what mbench score you get on it. Um, uh, <laughs> Maybe um, in the future this would be really awesome. <laughs> I yeah. hope uh, also to get uh, higher with the frequency. This is just the limitation of the I think two layer boards and a lot of pin headers and a lot of going up and downs of signals and so on. I hope with the next version, we can go with one single board with four layers. So this will, uh, I think, make things easy with the parasit parasitic uh, values, parasitic capacitance, resistance, these things. I think this is the main culprit for such a low frequency of my CPU, but I think I can improve it in my future, future release. Just wanted to say it. <laughs> Okay. Any questions from anyone on the floor? You've answered the question. I was going to ask you how many layers on the board. The fact there are only two layer boards is also quite impressive. Um, and yeah, certainly I putting just... some more layers is just to calm signals down more. Well, I'm just a student. And at that point, this was really end. Like, well, experiment. It will go. Maybe it will work. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, yes, I don't, mark on it. <laughs> and yeah, and they cost money, just, cost real money. 
Yeah, yeah. And for students, this is not really a just hobby project to order such a large quantity of four six layer boards just as a fun thing. I designed it to be as compact as possible, to be as cheap as possible, basically, for this, this reason. But I think we can improve on the cost even more.